In this lecture, we take on one of the most distinctive features of almost every human society, which is inequality. Just as this image suggests, at the core of this subject is the fact that some have more and some have less. What we're going to focus on here is three sociological theories of inequality, those of functionalism, conflict theory, and those of Max Weber. But first, let's pause for a minute on what we mean by social inequality. In any society, the term refers to how wealth, power, and status are unequally distributed. In the current day, the key driver of social inequality is wealth. At other points in history, it has taken different forms. In the ancient world, for instance, the basis of hierarchy was often religion, and the priests were at the top of the heap. Remember the great chain of being from Module 1. That's the schematic we're looking at now on the right side of the screen, which was a key rationalization for the religious and social inequalities that distinguished medieval Europe before the Industrial Revolution. We can also talk about social stratification, which emphasizes the sense of inequality as a kind of layering. It also gets across the idea, as does this image, that social stratification is not a temporary phenomenon, but very difficult to change. We begin now with an influential take on inequality from a functionalist position proposed by Kingsley Davis and Wilbert Moore as the Second World War ended. This position starts with the point that some jobs are more important than others because they contribute more to society. Along with that is the idea that the training for more important jobs requires more of a sacrifice, both in terms of time and money. This leads us to their next point, that people willing to make those sacrifices will only do so if there are incentives in terms of money and prestige. Which leads to the bottom line, that social inequality, according to Davis and Moore, is functional for society. There are several critiques of this functionalist position on social inequality. First, although it presents a compelling theory about uh, a social basis for inequality, it doesn't explain the immense gaps we see between rich and poor, or how they are growing. In Canada, for instance, top CEOs earn about 200 times the salary of the average worker. Is this really because they are 200 times more important? The other thing ignored in the functionalist position is the fact of pre-existing inequalities. Not everyone can afford to study for so-called important positions because we don't come into this life on a level playing field. Whether we are talking inherited wealth or simply parents with higher income and education levels, some of us have an advantage over others. Which brings us to the work of Karl Marx, the founder of conflict theory in sociology. For Marx, to understand any society in terms of equality or inequality, you have to start with its mode of economic production. For instance, the feudal system in Europe was based on control over agricultural land by the nobility which resulted in a particular type of social relationships between peasants and landlords. Our current system of capitalism is based on control of everything needed to produce goods and services, which creates a different set of relationships. Let's look a little closer at this. In a capitalist system, the dividing lines are between those who own the means of production, companies, factories, etc., and those who work for them. Marx called those who own the means of production, the bourgeoisie, and those who work for them, 
the proletariat. The key thing here is that the relationship between these two groups is unequal and antagonistic. A factory owner's motivation is to increase profits for shareholders. And one key way to do that is to exploit workers by expecting them to work harder or for less. Over time, Marx argues, workers become more aware of their collective exploitation and there is a revolution leading to communism. Now, the theory of communism was all about social equality based on workers controlling their own labor, instead of doing the bidding of the bourgeoisie. In this utopian form, worker control would exist in factories and on farms, which is why the symbol of communism, in the symbol on the left hand, is a sledgehammer and a curved scythe. It was also painting a picture of a social and cultural utopia. You would contribute what you could and you would receive what you needed. In practice, communism didn't really work out that way, perhaps hinted at in the automatic rifle we can see slung over the shoulder of one of the workers in the right-hand image. The Marxist position has been critiqued for several reasons. For one thing, the history of the industrialized world didn't play out the way Marx thought it would, and for two reasons. First, the rise of labor unions to protect the rights of workers, and actually that's an important legacy of Marx's influence. Second, Marx didn't anticipate the rise of what we call white-collar workers, meaning people who don't work in the factories or the fields, but in offices in front of computers. In other words, people who don't share any sense of affinity with factory workers. The other thing Marx didn't predict was the transformation of working conditions and the rise of wages. People are still exploited, but not in the same way as during the years of industrialization. Another flaw in the predictions of Marx is that even though there have been a lot of experiments in communism, it has not taken root and sustained itself anywhere. In this sense, China is an interesting example, technically communist, but also the epicenter of global manufacturing for capitalism. Finally, where communism has been tried, social inequality did not fade away as predicted, but simply took different forms. There's a joke that came out of Russia in the 1970s. Under capitalism, one class exploits the other, but under communism, it's the other way around. Finally, we come to the sociologist Max Weber. Weber's enduring legacy was to stress that stratification in a capitalist system is more complex than Marx had envisaged. In addition to class, which was the linchpin of Marxist analysis, Weber noted that social inequality is also determined by status and power. In addition, he foresaw the rise of white-collar workers and professionals as groups with interests that were distinct from the industrial working class.